Today on Locked on Horn Frogs, how does TCU replace the production of Quentin Johnston? And could it come from the slot in some cases? We'll talk about that next on Locked on Horn Frogs. You are Locked on Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Locked On Horn Frogs. I'm Stephen Simcox, your host. Uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, we're working towards 600 subscribers there, which is really cool. Also, you can subscribe wherever it is you get your podcast in the audio form. So TCU has to replace the production of Quentin Johnson somehow this season. And it's going to be tough. I mean, QJ... Uh, he, I think it's possible he's a first-round pick. I still think that's likely, even though it seems like he's kind of falling down some draft boards as people take a deeper look into his film study because of some of the body and catching and just some of the inconsistency. I think he's going to be a really good NFL receiver, though, even though TCU hasn't had a ton of success with the guys transitioning to the league at that position lately. Um, but as far as the Frogs go, they have to find a true number one wideout again. And – the outside receivers this year, uh, just the receiver room in general, there's a ton of potential. I was talking with Tommy Fisher about this Friday. Uh, there's a ton of talent there. Um, you got an incoming freshman like Cordell Russell, who is dealing with an injury right now, I believe. Um, but he had a great high school career. Uh, even as good as he is, I think it's going to be really tough for him to just step in immediately and be a major contributor as a freshman, even though I think he'll get, he'll definitely get some opportunities. Um, Savion Williams, who was good last season. Now, you know, Savion doesn't have the speed and the breakaway ability that Quentin does. He is good at using his body to go up and get the football. Uh, and they use him as sort of a possession receiver, a security blanket at times, which, um, which was a, you know, a good thing for Max Duggan. Uh, but he's, he's next man up as the outside wide out. Uh, Jordan Hudson, who showed some great flashes last year as a true freshman, he'll be there next year. But, you know, the the reports out of spring camp and what Coach Dykes has been talking about in his media availability lead me to believe that the biggest strengths for this team uh, is really in the slot. It's guys like JoJo Earl, the transfer from Alabama, John Paul Richardson, the transfer from Oklahoma State, Major Everhart, um, the sophomore from Amarillo Tassosa. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's exciting. And can you replace – it's going to be by committee. You're going to have to replace Quentin's production just with a little bit of everybody, right? This guy has 600, 700 yards. This guy maybe has 800 yards. Maybe you have one receiver that – you know, has a thousand yard plus season. Um, but I do get the impression just with Chandler Morris and his ability to excel at some of those short and intermediate throws that honestly Max struggled with at times. Um, the players that you have over the middle, as I said, John Paul Richardson, Jojo Earl, um, Major Everhart, even though I think he's going to slide more into the Darius Davis role of pop passes, quick games, screens, using that speed that he has to make something out of nothing um, in the short game. Kendall Bryles likes to run a lot of RPO. There's going to be more tempo in this offense. They would use tempo uh, situationally under Garrett Riley, but that has always been – the staple of, you know, the Browse coaching tree. And that offense in, in general is get that first first down and then let's go. We're moving. We're keeping the defense on their heels. We're trying to not allow them to substitute. Um, we're getting up and down the field. Jared Wiley going over the middle. Uh, Jack Besh, whenever he's healthy. There's just so many names. Even guys like Corey Wren who um, – didn't get a lot of play last year, and I've dealt with some injuries, but played that running back slash receiver position at Florida State was a uh, was a big time 
you know, special teams guy for the Seminoles. Is this the season where you see him get more involved in the offense? I think you could be. So uh, as strange as it sounds, this might be the type of thing where somebody steps up in place of Quentin Johnson, but it's not necessarily your big prototypical outside wide receiver. It's somebody making things happen over the middle. Um, John Paul Richardson is a really good route runner, uh, was a solid player for Oklahoma State last season. I have high hopes for him. I think JoJo Earl, same camp, right? Like didn't have a ton of opportunities at receiver at Alabama, but makes guys miss, makes things happen in space, runs precise routes, uses his speed and explosiveness to his advantage. Those are players that can make a huge difference for your football team, uh, and I feel like it's the biggest strength of this offense. You have some questions at running back. You have you – know, I, I think still some unanswered questions at quarterback just because we haven't seen Chandler play a whole lot. But wide receiver position, sort of like last year, I, I talked a lot about how they there was depth, there was talent, but there was also a ton of untapped potential. You're really banking on guys stepping up and having the type of seasons that they haven't had before. Uh, and Sonny Dykes did a good job of maximizing the talent, uh, and Garrett Riley as well, as maximizing the talent that wide receiver room had. And I think they'll do the same this year. You also got guys like Blair Conright on the outside, who, you know, Blair was, was a good player for TCU for the first couple of years of his career, was not as involved last season. Uh, but maybe this can be a bounce back season for him as he's got, you know, a full year under this coaching staff now. Uh, when we come back, so how do you protect Chandler Morris and company and make this offense run? We'll discuss that. Before we do that, though, I do want to talk about Built Bar. Built Bar is the best protein bar around. Um, if you're looking for a healthy snack, if you're looking for, you know, something good to eat that's not going to make you feel guilty about cheating on your diet or not uh, – eating the right food, the best food, then Built Bar is where you need to go. You can go to BuiltBar.com and get 15% off your next order. If you use the promo code LOCKEDON, you can also find Built Bar at your local Sam's Club. Most bars only have 180 calories and they have real ingredients, real chocolate, peanut butter, um, whatever it is. It's not the fake stuff that makes you say, okay, well, that didn't taste great, but at least at least I was able to eat healthy. Built Bar will tie you over. It'll fill you up and it won't make you feel guilty about eating it. BuiltBar.com. Use that promo code locked on, or you can find them at your local Sam's Club. Um, and they're supposed to be in stores at Walmart now as well. So it's exciting. So Walmart and Sam's Club or online. Again, that's Built Bar, the best protein bar around. All right, it is locked on Horn Frogs. Um, segment two here. Sorry if this is episode's a little shorter than normal. I am uh, dealing with some sort of illness. Um, one of the great things about having small children, as I'm sure those of you listening with small kids know, is that they bring your uh, they bring their germs to you, and then you get infected with whatever they did. So uh, my 18 month old had some sort of cold or virus last week that I have appeared to uh, to catch myself. So fighting through that, but we're good. I'm feeling better this morning than I did last night. So. That's a positive thing. I have a random question for our listeners and viewers. You can hit me up on YouTube. You can also hit me up on Twitter, at SimcockSteven, uh, the show that I locked on TCU, either way. Um, so I found myself watching the Elite Eight yesterday, and I am not the best, like, SEC fans really seem to root for their conference, no matter what it is. They take pride in their conference winning. Um, I'm not the best about that when it comes to the Big 12. Now, uh, Kansas State, I wouldn't have minded seeing them in the Final Four. I like Jerome Tang a lot. I like that team. They're a fun group. Um, and, yeah, I thought it would have been cool if they made the Final Four. They end up losing to FAU. Texas and Miami uh, also squared off. And I know as – a Big 12 fan, I should probably be rooting for Texas. But I found myself, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. I was rooting for Miami. Uh, and part of that is because I know, like, Texas is moving on. And so it's hard 
Like they're just they're not representing the Big Twelve. Oklahoma the same way. They're not going to represent the Big Twelve in twelve months or so. So I don't feel this huge um pull to root for them. Also, full transparency. Like Baylor is the team that I hate losing to the most. One because of the rivalry. Also, just because a lot of my family and friends are associated with Baylor in some way or the other. Root for them. So I usually catch a lot of flack uh, when TCU loses and whatever it is. But uh, did, were you rooting for Texas yesterday? Um, it's really hard for me to ever root for Texas. I just, as someone who grew up never cheering for them in the state and the fact that their flagship program and their fans are, you know, so proud to be Texas fans and so entitled about kind of who they are and what they do. It's just, it's tough for me to root for the horns. Uh, Kelly Norcross hit me on Twitter yesterday and said she also was not rooting for the horns. Um, she's excited. Houston is replacing Texas in the Big 12. She turned the game off after they got ahead big and um, was surprised by the outcome. Yeah, I mean, I was doing stuff around the house and I saw they were up, they were up 10, you know, up 13, 15 at some points in the second half. And I'd moved on. I was like getting kids ready for dinner and that kind of thing. And then I looked up and it was suddenly Miami was down by six. I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll lock into this. And Kane's got it done. Uh, referee's going to help them there. But sorry for that short tangent. Were you rooting for Texas? Or do you find yourself rooting for the Canes yesterday afternoon? You hit me on YouTube in the comments or on Twitter. I'm at Simcox Steven. Um, it's back to TCU football for a minute. And the most important thing about this offense, you know, I, I talked about the talent wide receiver. I think they have good skill position players. Running back, there's some question marks, but I feel like ultimately there's enough there that they can be productive at that position. Um, this offensive line is the key. They were so fortunate last year to be healthy all through the year on the O-line, and they're getting Andrew Coker back. They're getting Brandon Coleman back. Those will be your your booking tackles. I know there was some discussion about, like, could you move Coleman inside and maybe bring along Tommy Brockermeyer? That doesn't appear to be the case. I think uh, – you know, if you have if you have two tackles that started 15 games last year, even with the disaster that was the Georgia game, that was not their only problem, even though it was, in my mind, the most glaring issue is that the O-line just could not block against that ferocious Georgia D-line. But those give you two experienced players on the edges um, that should be able to protect Chandler Morris on a week-in and week-out basis. The interior... You're replacing uh, Wes Harris, Alan Ali, and Steve Avila, which is a, a really tall task because those guys were so good last season um, and so consistent, so physical. And so it appears John Lands is going to slide into one of those interior spots, maybe even play center. He's been working there at that center position. Um, Patrick Willis, or excuse me, Willis Patrick, the Jackson, Strait, the Jackson State transfer, I uh, got him confused with the former Niners uh, linebacker for a second. The Jackson State transfer, who is huge, he should be at one of those other guard spots. Um, and we'll kind of see who fills out the rest of that O-line. But um, I think there's talent there. You know, the biggest thing about the offensive line, continuity is so huge. You have to communicate well. You have to – uh, you know, figure out your responsibilities, figure out when there's blitz packages, who am I blocking, what's the guy next to me doing, how are we going to block this up, how are we going to protect the QB, and it's one of the toughest things to do um, at that position. You have to be physical. I think they'll be physical in the run game. There's a lot of good size there. Uh, my big concern is what, do you, what are they going to be able to do in the passing game? Can they give Chandler Morris time? and they give him a clean pocket because he is, you know, a smaller guy. He showed some escapability in that Baylor game a couple seasons ago. He showed the ability to get outside the pocket and make plays. Um, but I think, you know, if he's going to make a living and have a really good season, it's going to be because this O-line is protecting him and getting it done at a high level on a week-in and week-out basis. So, um, again, a lot of potential there, but you got to do it. And – O-line is one of those positions where you need experience. And so uh, leaning on those tackles on the outside especially 
will be a big key this year. TCU baseball, they go 5-0 and this week. They just swept Kansas. We'll talk about that to close things up on Locked On Horn Frogs. I do want to talk about FanDuel, though. FanDuel is the best uh, way to bet, the best way to wager. They're the official betting partner of the NBA. Uh, Major League Baseball is right around the corner, and they're heavy involved with MLB, too. March Madness, Final Four coming up. Uh, they have a safe, secure, and easy-to-use app. Um, you can also go to fanduel.com slash locked on to take advantage of their no sweat first bet deal. Again, that's no sweat first bet. You can put as little as five dollars down and get up to a thousand dollars in bonus bets, bet on the money lines, make prop bets, whatever you're interested in, you can do it at FanDuel. Again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on to take advantage of that no sweat first bet deal. FanDuel, it's where the game starts, official betting partner of the NBA. TCU, are they TCU baseball? They're not back in the top 25 D1 baseball. I uh, did not rank them this morning, but they do go 5-0 and over the week. Beat ACU, beat Northwestern in a couple midweek contests, and then swept Kansas over the weekend. Jayhawks, not a good baseball team, um, and they kicked the ball around the yard a lot. Their pitching staff uh, is just not very deep at all. Bullpen really struggled. But TCU did what they're supposed to do. They took advantage of their opportunities. Um, one on Friday in a close game, won that one 8-6. They're actually down 5-2 after a three-run homer by Kansas in the fifth inning. Uh, I'm, I'm getting concerned about Ryan Vander High. It just it feels like these these shaky starts are becoming more common where he gives up some extra base runners, um, gives up some big-time hits. He went four and a third on Friday night, six hits, five runs, five earned, four walks, five strikeouts. You know, he always misses a lot of bats. He always makes things happen. But – um, for a Friday night starter, he just has not been good enough. Has not been going deep in games. Has not been pitching efficiently, uh, and did not look good again on Friday. So, not sure what the plan is there, but um, it wasn't great for for Vander High again on Friday night. Garrett Wright made an appearance again out of the bullpen uh, as he kind of works his way back from an injury. Went a third of an inning, gave up one hit. Um, and then got the next guy out. He came in a 6-5 game, did give up a hit to make it 6-6. Luis Rodriguez closed it out after TCU scored a couple runs in the bottom of the eighth inning. Uh, Luke Boyers had a good weekend, had a few hits on Friday night, even though one of those hits was a triple that probably should have been ruled an error. The the uh, right fielder just fell down, <laughs> chasing the ball down, and that was one of the many uh, ways that Kansas – allowed extra base runners um in a in a in a tough weekend for them. But Luke Boyer seems to be heating up. Uh so that's an encouraging sign. And yeah, TCU, they took care of business on Friday. And then Saturday and Sunday uh were absolute blowouts. Frogs went 18 to 5 on Saturday. Rough day, uh a rough weekend for this Kansas pitching staff. Um, only nine hits on Saturday afternoon, but they end up scoring 18 runs, which is really impressive. Trey Richardson had uh, two hits and three RBIs on Saturday. He was he was your big guy. Cole Fontenelle continues to make things happen. He had a couple hits on Saturday as well. Um, Carson Bowen had a three-run homer on Saturday afternoon, which was uh, cool to see. Um, from a pitching perspective, Cole Klecker, seven innings, eight hits, three runs, two earned. I mean, again, Cole's guy, like he's not going to miss a lot of bats. The ball's going to be put in play, but when you play good defense behind him, you can survive. He's probably going to give up a couple runs, but he's a, he's a dude that can give you innings. And he was effective again on Saturday. Mason Speaker and Justin Hackett closed it out. Mason Speaker gave up a couple runs in his inning of work. Uh, but overall, business-like effort by TCU. And then on Sunday, Frogs win again, 14-0. They run rule KU. Cam Brown was impressive. Seven innings, two hits, uh, zero earned runs given up. Ended up pitching a complete game because it was a, a run rule situation. Um, their advantage to having Cam throw on Sunday, I mean, that's a really lively arm to have going in a sweep situation or in a rubber match. Um but I wonder if Cam's going to end up as your Friday starter at some point because his stuff is electric. 
you know, he struggled at the beginning of the game again, a lot of couple base runners, but then quickly resolved that. And this is true for all pitchers, but it's really just about command with Cam. When he's throwing his fastball low in the zone, 94, 95, when he's throwing his, his secondary breaking stuff for strikes, he's really tough to beat. So, again, nice start from him. Uh, Braden Taylor hit a home run. That was his only hit of the or one of two hits for him on the weekend. He's got five hits in Big 12 play. Four of, his, four of them have been homers. He's really struggling with batting average, but he continues to put the ball over the fence. Um, so that's a big deal. You just like to see Braden start using all fields again and being the type of hitter that we know he can be, the type of complete hitter that we know he can be. But, you know, kind of more of the same for uh, for him this weekend. CC so plays UTA Tuesday, and then they go to Lubbock to take on Texas Tech next weekend. That'll do it for Locked on Horn Frogs. We'll be back tomorrow. It's your team every day.